So hello, um, I'm a complete minority here because I work for old-fashioned print magazine. Um, I don't work for online, um, and that's why I decided I do an experiment with you today. I'm not having a presentation. I do it the very old-fashioned way I speak, <laughs> and well, let's see how, how it turns out. Um, the magazine I'm working for, it's called Profil. It's a political magazine. It was founded in the 70s, and um, from the beginning on, it strongly rely relied on data journalism because the idea was uh, if you do political or economic journalism and don't rely on data, it's just like society journalism but with less beautiful people. So uh, that's why they started to use data from the very beginning on. And um, listening to the colleagues from the UK, you sometimes get very jealous because we've got nothing at all like in Freedom of Information Act here in Austria. So um, a major work is just to collect the data, um, to get in hold of the data, um, and uh, presenting the data is the very last question because the hard part is just to collect them. So um, I'm working mainly in the field of budget, social security, tax discussion, and in the post-Lehman years, um, financial and economic crisis. Um, I'm very convinced that at a conference like that, the most boring part is that if every, every speaker tells the same that the speakers before them, in my case, in not as good English. <laughs> so I want to stress some points that the speakers didn't have and want to tell you about um, three projects we, we did with data. Um, first of all, um, I told you there's um, not a Freedom of Information Act in Austria, but sometimes there are great windows of, of opportunity. For example, um, there's been, for the non-Austrians uh, amongst you, there's uh, kind of a big scandal around the former Minister of Finance. Finance is um, under supervision because, I mean, there's stories around that he may have spent some money for his friends. There's a lot of talk about going bright money going on around politicians and that's why a commission of inquiry was established in the Austrian parliament. Um, investigating which lobbyists paid home how much money in order to get what law, which politicians or what parties received money from whom and so on. This commission is a gold mine for journalism in Austria because um, a lot of documents are, are delivered to parliament which are normally strictly secret. Um, so hundreds of pages reach parliament every week and there's a lot of stories waiting there. Um, the magazine I'm working for did a lot of great coups, um, uh, but the trick is a way to find a way to get in touch with these documents um, because um, they are delivered to parliament, but you have to find a source who allows you to read that. And now starts sometimes the boring stuff. You have to imagine you sit in a little room in parliament, mainly dark, and you get hundreds of boxes of tax accounts, files and stuff, and you start reading it. Um, it can be very boring because you don't find a story and after a couple of hours you see, oh, that's it. And there you've got the story. And then um, starts the second part. Then you need some help to interp uh, of interpretation because um, you have to be a specialist to read some bank accounts or to see which money has been delivered from Austria to Switzerland, to Liechtenstein, to Barbados and back. So to follow the tracks of the money um, is kind of a secret. Um, and you mainly need some help um, to do that. So what we mainly do is once we gather the documents, um, we ask for a scientist, a specialist or whatever to help us interpret that, to interpret them. Um, the uh, bad thing about it is uh, a work like that is very time consuming. So you can spend hours and hours. So uh, what we mainly do is we form some teams to split the work. We try to put some specialists for kind of fields together in order to find out the story. Um, and. Um, this time-consuming kind of work is very hard to do with uh, shrinking newsrooms, uh, which are kind of reality right now. So um, I want to have a warning because I mean um, to all the, the bosses, because the more you shrink the newsroom, the more you um, make it not possible the documents that politicians want to hide come to <laughs> come to be seen, and and that's not the idea of data journalism. So and. Um, 
Another story we did uh, was, it's a complete different topic. Uh, we did a story about um, why the car is, the, uh, is, 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 is a, very, uh, a very dangerous in, um, thing. And we tried to get a lot of data for that. Um, data which we thought the readers might be interesting. For example, um, the commuters that commute to Vienna every time, um, if you just um, form them into a line, all the cars, um, it's the whole way from Vienna to London and uh, the way back. So with that kind of statistics, um, you can show the readers a lot of things. Or another example, we did statistics, well, how many space have cars got in Vienna? How many space have um, children playgrounds got? How many uh, spaces have people to live there? How many noise is coming out of the cars? And how many space is in Vienna reserved for cars? How many space it is in Berlin? And then um, what is always a great success is to readers is um, to make a thing like, how much do you pay for a meter of parking space in cities like Berlin? Vienna um, and, and stuff like that. And with that, um, the, the idea of the magazine is working for that every story has to have a, a strong thesis and you can underline this thesis with the data. So that means um, we're working on a, on a weekly basis. That can mean that um, our normal rhythm is we start on Monday and on Friday night the story should be ready. And sometimes uh, on the middle of the week, like on Wednesday, um, you came to the conclusion, well, my thesis was very beautiful, but the data <laughs> showed a completely different direction. So you have to be flexible enough just to change the thesis if you find out that the data um, don't, don't um, support it. Um, so as a print magazine has, um, in different to an online magazine, has got very limited space. So um, the project you shown are very beautiful, but it would be impossible to put them in print because they consume a lot of pages, <laughs> as we call it. Um, so in print, um, a lot of work um, is to select the data. Um, select the data, uh, which ones do we want to present to the readers? How do we want to present? send them and how um, can we have the maximum effect. I mean, there's always the thing you can have in support um, section on online, but the idea is the print story should be complete in itself. So readers don't, shouldn't be forced to look online as well, but the print story should be completed um, itself. Um, so um, there, I talked about the non-existent Freedom of Information Act, um, but since Austria is a member of the European Union in the, in the middle of the 90s, it's got much easier to get to data, because funnily enough, um, Austrian government delivers some parts of the data to the European Union, and that's a way to get a hold of the data, funnily enough. So you have to do some little detours sometimes, and um, for example, like um, call the European Statistics organizations and then you can find some Austrian data and um, and then there's of course some data around um, but you have to ask for them at universities um, at some um, scientists at some statistics bureaus and um, then, um, as the colleagues that talked um, uh, before me said, then we mainly ask for help as well because I mean you have to imagine there's a lot of pages coming out, there's a lot of data coming out, but the data itself is not a story. You have to find the story in that, and for that it might be helpful to um, call for a scientist, for a researcher who helps you read them. Um, and um, the third project um, I want to talk to you that we did was a project that um, seemed in the first case paradox but in the second uh, the second view it's not um, as I told you um, I'm doing a lot of story about the financial and eco economic crisis and um, while working with that, a problem came out that not, 
not all data are available. I don't mean that data are secret or you don't get, they don't, you get, don't get hold of them, but they are not existing at all. So the question comes up, who decides which kind of data are researched and which are not? I give an example. After the financial crash, after all the billions of euro and dollar that were transferred to the banks and the economy, all governments around the world started to consolidate the budgets. So even in, um, in nearly every country around the world, the question came up, who's going to pay for the crisis? And a lot of people, politicians included, began the discussion to tax the rich or so-called rich. Um, it was a big field for politicians to um, present all their ideological views. And now comes the interesting data problem, uh, and that was the project we did. Here in Austria, and the situation is the same in a lot of uh, Western countries, we've got a lot of data on the social system. We know how many people are on social welfare, we know how much money they get uh, as social benefits, we know exactly how many people are unemployed and how high the unemployment benefit is, we know how many people are employed, how much they earn, and how much taxes they pay. Anybody who's interested in that can get a lot of data about the sectors, one could very vaguely describe as the sectors of the poor and the working class. Uh, so it's always kind of easy to highlight with data all aspects of the social system and so on. But nearly no data exists in Austria on fortune and wealth. So the project we did um, was to stressing why obviously nearly nobody so far had an interest to research all this data. Who owns how much? Um, where are the big owners around? How did they came to the money? Did they inherit it? Um, was, did they earn it and stuff? And um, we found out there's a significant lack on data on this field. Even the European Central Bank and the national banks operate only with estimations because there's very less data around. And um, this lack of data, of course, has got consequences. The political and economic discu discussion is widely open for all kind of ideological interpretations. And there's very few data around to objectify the arguments. Um, so um, instead of repeating all the arguments um, of the politicians which were not relying on data, we raised the discussion, why are these data not available? Who had an interest um, in that? Why is it so diff difficult to find this data? Why is nobody researching on that? And um, w once you raise the question, you come to a lot of interesting points. So who in Austria pays for what kind of research? What institution is um, paying for what kind of research? And why are some research projects not funded at all? So. Um, in raising these discussions uh, to our readers, um, we had a lot of interesting stories. And the um, second fun part with that kind of, um, on the first side, paradox um, data situation is that you can very well um, um, show that politicians sometimes say things on just estimations, ideas, and they don't have any data bases as well. So. The um, point I'm trying to make is that, in my point of view, is that journalists not only work with data to underline or unmask discussions or arguments, it's also important that journalism investigates the lack of data in some fields and the reasons for it. For, for example, to inform the readers that there is very few data around on wealth is an um, important function as well, uh, because I think, and I'm very convinced that we as journalists um, should not silently accept the fact that on some fields data are missing because they are not researched. Um, stressing the lack of data on some fields or some sectors is one form of investigative journalism as well, especially if we can show why some data are missing. Um, we made the experience um, when we started the project that we got a lot of reactions, even from university professors or other scientists, like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And uh, the nice thing about it is that um, after that, a research project is being started. So we don't know, maybe in one year or a couple of months, we can um, 
um, finish the project now having with now having data. I give you another example for that why uh, when data are missing, um, I think um, all of you know there's the topic of migration is discussed in Austria now very emotionally for years and years and years. Um, I don't want to stress the party functions on that, but I want to stress that um, one important point in that situation has always been education and the situation at school. And um, there has been a new word, I said in German first, um, Kinder nicht deutscher Muttersprache. That means kids that don't have German as the mother tongue. Um, with that data, with that figures, it's always operated uh, in the discussion. And the data show, show that around 50% of the kids who attend school don't have German um, as the mother tongue and are no native German speaker. That sounds like a lot, but it tells you nothing. Because you always, when working with data, you have to know how the data are produced and what's the background of the data. For example, this 50% of the kids with so-called not German mother tongue is figured out like that. If one of the parents, father or mother, has been born outside of Austria, the kids are counted as kids with not German as mother tongue. That doesn't mean anything. They can speak perfectly German, they can be born in Austria, they can be raised in Austria, they can speak perfectly German, or they can speak a word. So in this um, data collection, we've got a lot of data, but um, it doesn't tell you doesn't tell us anything. So I think uh, one of the important points is always to look how data are, are gathered and how to interpret them. So as we did a project, um, one more minute. Sorry. Um, as we did a project in the paper um, showing this difference, uh, the so-called 50% of uh, kids not German mother tongue, and what does it say to you? The interesting effect is, if you do a thing like that, a lot of teachers um, kind of call you and say, well, I've got a class, and in statistic, um, there is 70% of kids with uh, not speaking German from statistical data. In reality, I've just got one kid who just migrated here. So, um, in looking at the background, how data are collected, you might find a lot of stories as well. So, sorry. <laughs> Thank you.